I think that's part of the responsibility of a science fiction writer is any technology we show or invent, we have to show going wrong. NPR did a story about that where they were saying science fiction writers are complementary to scientists because we challenge uh, what they're creating and could even introduce possible risks. And, you know, while scientists can go, well, that's fictional, but we're, we're writing from a very human perspective and it's good to think of all those angles. Yeah, I saw um, a meme a while ago online which was science will tell you what you can do humanities will tell you why it might not be a good idea welcome to speculative sandbox your audio playground for creative storytellers my name is vicky lawn and each episode i and a guest will unpack a fiction trope with an eye for character development and narrative structures Make sure to look for Speculative Sandbox on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, where you can join the conversation. Leave comments or questions, or let us know what other tropes we should cover. When the real world just doesn't cut it, let's get lost in a fictional one. NASA predicts it will land astronauts on Mars by 2040. SpaceX says it will beat NASA by at least a decade. What does it take to get us off Earth and exploring the rest of the planets in our solar system? And what will we find when we get there? Science fiction writers have been speculating this for decades. I am so excited to welcome Gareth L. Powell to the podcast to discuss planetary travel. Gareth is a multi-BSFA award-winning British science fiction author who writes action-packed epic adventures. His latest book, Stars and Bones, is out now and his Embers of War novels are currently being adapted for the screen. I really enjoyed recording this episode, and I think you'll enjoy listening to it too. So thank you for joining Speculative Sandbox. You and I are coming from separate continents, you in the UK, me in the United States, but you just visited us for a little bit, or you came to California. So how did you enjoy your time stateside? Oh, I love it. Absolutely love it. That's, that was my second time um, in six weeks. Um, awesome visiting. what was your favorite part oh too too many to talk about i mean i went through we visited all the bookshops um in la and san diego and la jolla and everywhere we could find a, a speculative fiction bookshop um or geeky teas nice um, as well so love it love that whole area sort of eagle rock Glen, glendale pasadena santa monica the whole lot san diego great Nice. What about the food? Ah, oh, so much food. So many tacos. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah it's just amazing. Um, we we at so many different places, and everywhere we went was just the food was just fantastic. Whether it was like diner breakfast or In and Out Burger or you know a proper restaurant, it's just we found fantastic food everywhere. What would you say is the most different or interesting or startling culture change about coming to the United States compared to the UK? The thing that struck me on my first visit um, was that it's such a, everything there is such a cultural touchstone. Um, everywhere I went, I was walking along streets whose names I'd read in hundreds of books and heard referenced on TV shows. You know, every location I'd kind of heard somebody say something about it every you know I'd go to Santa Monica and I would my mind would be playing songs with the lyrics in you know I went in the Hollywood Hills and there were Eagles lyrics popping up in my head and it was just it was just amazed me how much those square miles of Los Angeles and that bit of the coast are so embedded in popular culture um, mm -hmm. just in, in movies films and um, and especially music that it just felt that I was kind of walking through a kind of unreal film set at times. Um, and it just made me realize the huge impact that Hollywood and, and that area has had on, on global culture. Mm -hmm. I have a little bit of that. I live in the desert. And so I, I usually when I see my land, my home captured in movies, it's always in the wild, wild west context. <laughs> so anytime I leave Arizona and I see, I go into California, I feel or anywhere else really where there's trees and grass <laughs> I feel like it's always a movie it's so foreign to me <laughs> okay so you um you were so awesome I had put out a call for uh guests and I really wanted to talk about 
planetary travel, specifically colonies on our planets in our solar system. And I said, who wants to talk about this? And you offered, and I was like, this is perfect. So thank you so much for, for raising your hand and, and being a part of this podcast. No worries. So my thought was to just kind of move through the planets, but first I wanted to talk about uh, space colonies and why they're a staple of science fiction. So for you, what makes them so fun or maybe so challenging to write? Um, I Yeah, my, my views on science fiction on uh, space colonies are very different from my views on real life space colonies. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, I love writing and reading books set on Mars, but when it comes to real life um, propositions for going and living on Mars, I kind of you you know the place is a freezing cold mm-hmm. hellscape with uh, um, highly radioactive surface, uh, air pressure so low you'd have to wear a, a pressure suit to go outdoors, dust so fine it would just destroy your lungs it would get in everywhere and everything so from that point of view if elon musk came and said gareth do you want to come to mars with me i'd be like absolutely no way elon (laughs) um but on the other hand kim stanley robinson's red mars is one of my favorite books um Mm -hmm. because i just love the way he he uses it as a way to basically rerun um the history of America um, from scratch, but against a completely different background. So and it becomes, you... oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, and he, he shows how you can set up a fair and equitable society using various different um, ways of doing it um, and various different philosophies and how you can bring that all together if you have the will and the opportunity. Um, so, yeah, for, for me, space colonies are in a lot of ways in fiction they're just microcosms that allow us to look at our world and comment on our world by externalizing it and using it as a small example um almost like a metaphor um, yeah. rather than a, a serious proposition i agree with you on the space travel thing i when i watch movies that are about like realistic astronaut experiences to me it seems to be very anxiety inducing and I um there are people that are just so brave and they will don that suit and if Elon Musk goes I'm gonna make you one of the first people to you know set up a home on Mars they'll be like sign me up and I'm like I'm glad we have people like you (laughs) because I'm not gonna do that (laughs) yeah so looking back on um space colonization and fiction there seems to be a line where a line right around the mid century where before that it's all pulp fiction before we knew or understood anything about the scientific structures of planets anything could be on venus and mars venus was envisioned to have dinosaurs walking on mars it's a lush tropical paradise but then after all the nasa information came out about what these planets were made of and what their living conditions were like then it, then the fiction changed with it and started to take on some of the the challenges um of those scientific conditions what are your thoughts on pulp fiction and then after pulp fiction uh well yeah as you said in the early part of the century i mean a lot of science fiction was basically westerns um Mm. with you know space colonies um instead of small towns in the midwest so um and the heroes would ride in on a rocket ship sort stuff out get back on the rocket ship and go away again kind of like mandalorian Um, now I don't know if you've seen that, but that was yeah, a very Western approach. It's it's very Western. Um, but I think I think as well, we had, if you go back to look at, because um, coming from the UK, we were very much a, a naval nation. Um, and there was a lot of exploring. And sort of in the 16th, 17th century, there were all sorts of tales of these foreign lands that the sailors went off to. And there were sort of well-documented stories of men who had no head but had a face in their stomach Mm. or two-headed people or all these weird sort of basically aliens that lived in these foreign lands and the sailors came back and told these tales Um, because we were populating um, the world using imagination. And the same thing was happening in the solar system. Um, I remember when I was at school, I read a a book called Kings of Space, 
by a writer called Captain W.E. Johns, who's most famous for writing uh, World War One and World War Two fighter pilot fiction about a character called Biggles. Um, and in his books, there's, you know, a, a Scottish inventor and his young, plucky young son uh, meet a, a, a weird scientist in Scotland who's built a flying saucer and off they go. And they discover, as you say, uh, that Venus is a, a lush tropical swamp and Mars is a desiccated desert um, filled with warlike people. And the asteroid belt is, was it used to be a planet, but they that's where they destroyed it because there was a war. Mm-hmm. And now they're afraid humanity has invented the atom bomb and is going to do the same thing so they're trying to step in um and at the point that was written you know that was fair enough speculation that there might be um civilizations on these two planets but then as our scientific awareness has broadened and our probes have gone out and reached things we start to realize no so we've had to push back this frontier that in the 16th and 17th century was across the sea and then in the 20th century was on neighbouring planets, and now in the 21st century is maybe out in other solar systems, other galaxies. So mm-hmm. we're, we're always pushing back the frontier of where weirdness is. So it seems um, like as we further our, our knowledge of the of the universe, then we are always going to be wondering what's beyond even that. Absolutely. And it's like it's kind of like a Schrodinger's cat thing, that the more we look, the further away the the weirdness has to be because all all those possibilities collapse down into a single uh, wave function and we we know what mars is now because we've we've had a look at it so uh we've opened the box and found a a desert so um yeah it's i I find those tales going back to your original question very much part of a long tradition of explorers tales um that is just the 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 sea is changing Mm, gotcha okay so it's like it's like pirates too westerns and pirates it's all telling the same idea but on the on a different frontier yes absolutely it's westerns pirates but also the roman empire that tends to get recycled a lot um, okay in terms of sort of intergalactic empires and they all look suspiciously roman they all have the senators they have the emperor um, and the, the palace intrigue so those are kind of i think those are the staples uh, the sort of the Venn diagram of science fiction in a lot of ways. Interesting. So that makes me think of the HB, no, Apple TV series uh, Foundation with Lee Pace. When you say Roman Empire, it makes me think of uh, the emphasis on the empire that's ruling, and it does kind of have that classic feel to it. Yes, very much. And I think that's probably because uh, most of Western literature um, kind of has a uh, the, the sort of classical uh, models of Rome and Greece and Egypt are our kind of precursor civilizations, and we we took a lot from them um, wholesale. And so, in a lot of ways, sort of Herodotus's histories and um, all all that kind of literature, the, the plays of Sophocles and stuff, they're kind of like almost our Ur myths beneath, um, on on top of which we built all our medieval literature and everything else. So. Um, it's not surprising that part, I think our, our literary imagination is kind of shaped by uh, those Mediterranean uh, cultures in a lot of ways. So then the fun part after, so we have this the establishment of cultures and societies, and then you throw in the post mid-century discoveries of science, uh, the scientific conditions of the planets, and now you get to play with science. Uh, in my research, I saw that there was about three different ways that humans can create colonies on other planets. The first one is terraforming, which is changing the planet to suit our needs. Then there's pantropy, which is changing the human to adapt to other planets. And then there's life support systems like domed cities, underground cities, that's that sort of stuff. What do you think is the most interesting type of um, adaptation or colonialism that uh, to write or to read from a fiction point of view um probably the most interesting is pantropy um talking about the different ways humans can be adapted to their different environments and how that would kind of bifurcate the species and we would end up with lots of different descendant species of humans um i think frederick pohl kind of looked at this in I think it was a novel called Gem. I might be wrong, 
where he looks at a man who is adapted to survive on the surface of Mars. And since then, that's been done in all sorts of ways in all sorts of different um, stories. As Stephen Baxter has written a lot of stories about um, humans who've been adapted to survive in different environments and then lost contact with Earth and developed their own in their own ways and their own societies and so on. So I think from a fictional point of view, that has the most kind of um, potential. Terraforming seems to take a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, although you could argue that what we've done to the um, environment here on Earth, we've done over the last 200 years. So it's maybe yeah. not as long a time as people think. Although maybe terror wrecking is easier than terraforming. Sure. Um, and I would, if we were going to put in any large scale terraforming effort, I'd like us to do that here on Earth first. Mm, yeah. Yeah. The to idea be- that you can completely change a planet, like I've seen ones where you create a giant umbrella to cool down Venus. I'm like, yeah. well, can we think about how that could help Earth first? <laughs> ex- ex- exactly. Because Earth is obviously the most earth-like planet we know of so Mm -hmm. let's just try and fix that before we try and build another one um and fixing that will teach us how to build another one um because we can't possibly take eight billion people to a new planet so some of us are going to be stuck here anyway so let's Mm -hmm. fix you know fix our own shit before we go and start messing around with somebody else's um so yeah and the life support systems i mean basically that's just dragging along a whole lot of plumbing Mm -hmm. and a food supply for some curious apes who've you know escaped from africa and are now you know at large in the universe um and totally unsuited to it so i mean the universe kind of knows that we shouldn't be out there and it's got a million ways to kill us from you know, radiation to um, vacuum to cold to overheating in the spaceship because it's so well insulated. So, you know, we we shouldn't be there. So um, maybe we'd need to be adapted for it. But uh, but then we've done it before because I, I mentioned we escaped from Africa. The human exodus, uh, the various waves moving up into Europe, we had to develop technology in order to survive because an unclothed human i mean i live in the uk i wouldn't survive a winter Mm. stark naked outdoors how cold does it get out there it it gets down to sort of i think probably about minus five to minus ten in the winter sometimes okay which isn't that cold but you know what mine gets down to (laughs) what 50 degrees fahrenheit like i it's so warm here my win my winters are other people's summers but my summers get pretty intense and i Yuck. wouldn't want to like if i didn't have shelter i'd be screwed yikes so yeah exactly so we've had to and when we came out of africa we were moving into the teeth of an ice age that was mm-hmm. gripping um europe and so we had to invent the technology or steal from the technology invented by neanderthals of furs and fire and hunting and um you know you know shelter and all these technologies that we just take for granted um that we couldn't actually survive without so moving into space isn't that huge a psychological jump in that would be reliant on technology because most of us already are mm-hmm. um but it would still be a huge resource drain um compared to you know maybe sending an intelligent machine which would need solar panels yeah um, and would fit into something the size of a suitcase maybe so it swings and roundabouts i can see uh, i see what you mean about it these all three of these ways actually i would hope that by the time we turn these methods to other planets that we've figured out how to do it on our planet because life support systems uh we i guess we could con- we can combat certain climate change issues by doming our cities or moving underground um and i think if we can't figure out how to do that here uh it'd be harder for us to do it out there but i wonder if it's a matter of it's hard to do that here it's messy there's so many people in their opinions where it's you know me being in charge of my space station i'm elon musk i'll just 
send a dome city onto the moon and no one's going to fight with me and I get to just do what I want. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, that scenario brings up its own problems in that, for instance, if you have, I won't pick on Elon, but if you have a billionaire mm -hmm. who founds his own space colony, whether it's on Mars or on the moon or whatever, why would he still be in charge if if money is no longer relevant? Mm, okay. Where what is his power? And his only power would be control of the life support system. So in that case, the inhabitants of the colony would be basically held at hostage because that would be his only leverage of control. Because once you get out there and you've got this new world and you do why why would the existing power structures um carry on just because this guy paid for the rocket you know just because he paid for the uber to mars why do you still have to listen to him um so there would there would be a kind of it's the same problem i see a lot of people talking about rich people talking about surviving doomsday or prepping for ecological collapse and they're saying how do i keep my security staff from turning on me because my, all my money will no longer, you know, what can they spend it on once the bomb has dropped or whatever? So how do I stop my security staff turning on me? And, you know, I've I've seen suggestions, well, explosive collars or, you know, I, I have the key to the food cupboard or whatever. But that just turns everyone into a hostage. And that isn't maybe the brave new world they're trying to create. Mm. So I think a lot more thought needs to be given to the the composition of these societies before you end up maybe living on a planet where you have to work for your air and water. Um, because if you don't, you die of thirst or you're chucked out onto the planetary surface and suffocate. So it's, um, it's something I haven't seen so much in fiction. I've seen kind of the, the, the revolution against the, um, you know, against Earth and we're going to declare independence, but I've not seen the one where the where the person who owns, basically owns the space colony, manages to justify why they are in charge and uh, why people should keep listening to them. By the landlord um, should be the powerful one. So then do you think, I've, heard, I've seen articles like in the past where you hear about billionaires vying for property. Do you think property is one way where you can secure your power on another planet? Um, only in so far as habitable property. Okay. So if, if they own the dome, which has all the air, then that will be quite valuable real estate. Um, but if it's a planet, for instance, that's been terraformed, um, uh, at least partially and people can breathe without having to be reliant on certain supplies. Um, and if people can grow their own food, property is literally kind of dirt cheap because you've got a whole world you can just go out into and settle and just you know uh stake a claim and say right this bit's mine mm -hmm. um kind of like you, you know kind of like in, in in america where people were there were land rushes and people would go out and stake a claim and, and build a house and start a farm yeah. um you know how much is the property worth in that case so if a billionaire owns 2,000 square miles, big deal because there's another 2,000 miles next door that has nobody in it at all. So you could just go out there and keep keep the frontier moving until you've covered the entire planet. So oh, Yeah, so there's going to be a process no matter what, some, some yeah. sort of fight. Okay. So with our, let's start with our, our good old rocky planets, which Earth is obviously a part of. We have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. And I'll just walk through a little bit of what conditions we writers are dealing with when we're writing about these colonies. So rocky planets are made mostly of rock and metal. They have a hot core surrounded by a layer of hot rock called the mantle. And on the surface is a thin layer of sol solid rock called the crust. Rocky planets are smaller than gas planets, but are made of heavier materials. And of course, those that are closer to the sun experience a lot more heat. So of the, of the, the planets I named, um, which one stands out to you the most as as challenging or most interesting to to colonize? Uh, 
or sort of taking them in order out from the sun, Mercury, the heat on the day side of Mercury um, is blistering. Um, and Mercury itself is little more than the the core of a larger planet with the outer layers have all been stripped away. So it hasn't got much in the way of kind of a magnetic field. Um, and there isn't much crust or mantle. What it is, I mean, it's mostly just a, a sort of solidified core. So I don't see any advantage to colonizing Mercury. I don't see why anyone would want to colonize Mercury. Mm -hmm. um, because of the heat and the radiation, unless it was to kind of put solar collectors on the surface in order to collect power to beam to other parts of the solar system. Uh, I was reading 2312 by Kim Stanley Robinson. Yeah. Have you read that one? I've not, no. Okay, so, uh, so this will be, might be interesting to you. The city of Terminator uh, is one of the, it's the only colony on Mercury. And the way he handled the fact that it's extremely hot all the, all the time on the sun facing side of the planet is that there is a track that wraps the whole planet and the city is domed and it sits on the track and it's always sitting at that point right before dawn or dusk. And as the sun heats up the track, the track expands and keeps pushing the city into the dark and, ah. and the city just keeps rolling around like that. And um, what ends up being the, the inciting incident for the book is someone bombs that track the city can't move on it anymore and it just roasts in the sun i just thought that was so interesting that I, I believe he used that um in blue mars or one of his other books as well okay um yeah uh, i've certain, certainly read i don't think i've read that book, but i've certainly read something by him about that where i think two characters get trapped on the surface and they have to run to catch up with the city mm -hmm. so, yeah um yeah, I mean, that is, but, you know, why go to all that trouble? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, that would be an incredibly precarious existence. Yeah. Um, You're constantly living on the edge. It's a city for, pe like, adrenaline junkies. Yeah, literally on the edge. Um, and, you know, you're only a few minutes from getting completely vaporized. Mm -hmm. um, so at any one time. So, yeah, I mean... That strikes me as probably one of the most unlikely. Okay. Um, Venus has a surface temperature that can melt lead. Um, used to be fairly Earth-like, but gradually the the water um, escaped into space and was broken up, broken up, and the, the hydrogen escaped into space, and, and um, everything boiled, and you're left with these clouds um, and this oven-like surface temperature. Um, I'm not sure, you know, quite what set that off, but it's the greenhouse effect. I think the fact that Venus might be the only planet that's rolling around the sun on its side, mm. um, could suggest that maybe a catastrophic impact knocked it sideways and set off this greenhouse effect. Do you think um, that Venus is a warning for earth or you think that it's a completely different set of conditions? I think Venus and Mars both show how an earth like planet can go wrong. Mm, okay. Um, I mean, it's, they're almost too perfect um, in being warnings because there was a brief time where all three of them had liquid water on their surface. So all three of them could possibly have hosted life at the same time. Um, and then Mars obviously wasn't dense enough to hold on to its atmosphere and it gradually thinned and... Um, and once the water, once the once the um, once radiation, you know, breaks up the H two O and the hydrogen's gone, mm -hmm. um, and the oxygen, uh, the oxygen bonds to anything it can, so you've got a very rusty red planet, and the hydrogen's gone, so you can't have water again because all the hydrogen's gone. Um, and yeah, the same with the same with Venus, but for slightly different. The the for the opposite reason that it got hotter, Mars got colder. Yeah, but I think in order to colonize Venus, you would either have to colonize the upper atmosphere or find a way to strip all those clouds away. Um, and I don't know how you would do that. Um, maybe some kind of algae in the cloud layer to generate oxygen and to um, create 
create water somehow. I have no idea. If we invent, you know, um, some form of nanotechnology that can push molecules around and just create whatever it likes out of whatever it likes, then all bets are off. Mm. Um, you could just drop a, drop a load of nanotech into the atmosphere and it would turn it all into oxygen and nitrogen. Easy peasy. But yeah. assuming we haven't got that kind of technology anytime soon, it, it, it would be a, a very big challenge. It would that be, be a form to... of terraforming to, to alter the atmosphere like that? Or is it yes. different? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because we would have to make it more Earth-like in order to survive on there. Um, and however bad Earth gets, it's going to be e easier to do that on Earth than it is on Venus mm -hmm. because it doesn't get any worse than Venus. Um, okay, so NASA, I think, likes the floating colony concept. When I was doing my research, they had something called the NABOC program, which conceptualized a floating colony. Uh, they were talking about the same conditions you're talking about, and they're looking at about 50 kilometers above the surface of Venus. The environment changes to the most Earth surface-like conditions within the solar system suitable for supporting airships. And of course, they have to figure out a lot of things like air pressure concerns and corrosiveness. Uh, but NASA spent some time on this hypothetical situation that ended up not really going anywhere, but I guess gave them more information. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, it, it goes back to the same question as Mercury. If, why go to all that bother? Um, because you will again be living in a very precarious position um, and maybe not so much protection from solar radiation that high up in the air. And if your airship fails, you're falling down into something, you know, a, a burning hell that will that will melt, literally melt your, your bones. Mm. So... You know, I can't imagine sleeping very soundly on one of those airships. <laughs> Interesting um, for fiction, but not what you want to deal with in reality. Yeah, I can't imagine anyone going, well, the earth is getting a bit dirty. Let's go and live on an airship above a roasting hellscape. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> it doesn't seem appealing, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, my theory uh, is if a toddler can't serve, like, you know, make it through the living conditions without going through some demise it's probably not a good idea i mean it's already hard enough for toddlers to to navigate earth but yeah if it's something that you know like mercury if you have to constantly stay one step away from the sun or venus where you gotta hope that your airship works um i can't imagine humanity lasting much longer no and you have to make those technologies a incredibly durable for a long time but also um idiot proof and mm -hmm. terrorist proof so that just raises it to a whole whole level of, of challenge that um you know we can't make cars that don't fall apart after 10 years really so a whole city in one of the most challenging environments possible we're able to deal with huge swings in temperature that's going to last 100 years i don't see it at the moment somehow as a writer how do you, when, when you're facing these kinds of circumstances, I, cause I always feel like it's such a great writing exercise. When you look at all the different conditions and societal uh, expectations to be able to look at these challenges and go, okay, I've come up with an interesting solution. Um, yeah. How much responsibility do you think it is on the writer to continue challenging and pushing new ideas? Or do you think it's like, we're all free to just do whatever we want. That's all just with suspend reality. As a writer, I like to keep what I'm writing at least plausible. Okay. Um, even if highly unlikely. So, um, because it, the environments um, I, I'm generating as I go, as I mentioned um, at the beginning, are to kind of serve the needs of the story and to uh, create these interesting societal microcosms we can use to examine, like uh, the, the simulations through which we can examine society or examine human nature or examine our relationship with the universe or with technology or whatever so they're they're more like sort of stage settings for a particular dramatization of a, a philosophical or um, dramatic point whereas i don't think any of us are i might be wrong but i don't think any of us are seriously sitting down and going right i'm going to design something that will work and can be done right now and here's all the specs and the design we're all we all fudge a little bit um because mm -hmm. we're not playing in the realm of 
strict science we're playing in the realm of fiction um mm -hmm. and however much science we put into our fiction however plausible we try to make it at some point we have to make massive assumptions um and you know assumptions that the human race is going to survive the next 50 years for a start that's a big assumption yeah um and so we have to go from there and, and we you know that we'll be able to afford to get into space that we'll find a way of living in space long enough um to create these places we'll find a way of traveling those distances we'll find a way of getting the resources to to do that and at the moment we don't have those resources um it would take the resources of the entire planet to create a space colony mm. um so yeah it's uh it's an interesting one it's yeah. definitely an interesting one but yeah i think we're definitely it's fun to build space colonies it's fun to build space colonies that go wrong in interesting and dramatic ways and i think that's part of the responsibility of a science fiction writer is any technology we show or invent we have to show going wrong um, absolutely npr did a story about that where they were saying science fiction writers are complementary to scientists because we challenge uh what they're creating and could even introduce possible risks and you know, while scientists can go, well, that's fictional, but we're, we're writing from a very human perspective and it's good to think of all those angles. Yeah, absolutely. I saw um, a meme a while ago um, online, which was science will tell you what you can do. Humanities will tell you why it might not be a good idea. Mm -hmm. So, and I think the illustration that came with it was from Jurassic Park. Yes, so, that, yeah. that's a really good example. So Mars is our other neighbor and just dry, 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 dry and cold. So do you think based off of whether or not it's worth inhabiting a planet, do you think Mars is worth it? I don't know about worth it. I mean, in order to, I mean, Mars is, is one of, you know, Mars and Venus, the two most Earth-like planets we can feasibly get to in a, a human lifetime at the moment. And as you say it's it's just desolate absolutely desolate and dry as a bone so unless we discover huge reserves of underground water there and can find a way to stop them all bring them to the surface but stop them all escaping immediately into space and and being broken apart and and, and freezing and, and what have you then assuming we can do that and assuming maybe we can crash an absolute ton of comets into the atmosphere to, to raise the, the humidity and generate a false atmosphere um, and heat the place up through the, the impacts. That process would take a very long time and would basically trash the surface all over again. Um, but yeah, I mean, theoretically, all that stuff could be done, but it would be a, it would be like um a medieval stonemason setting out to build a cathedral he he starts doing it but he knows that his great great grandson will probably be the one who finishes it so it's um it's a generational project Interesting. Um, so you mentioned you liked writing about mars what are some of your favorite creations on mars mm -hmm. yeah i mean up uh, what creations that I've created or creations I've read about? Oh, that you've created. Oh, right. Um, I I don't know. I mean, I've um, I've written some short stories, sort of set in domed cities where things are going wrong, or set on outposts um, in craters which have had domes put over them and atmospheres put in, or and so on. So it's, I mean. The story I think of most when I think of a story I wrote which was set on Mars, one, a story called The Last Reef that uh, was published in Interzone way back in 2005 or 2006. But that, as again, was basically a space western okay. um, set around a, a rogue nanotech outbreak. Um, but yeah, Mars very much does have the feel of the Wild West. In when you the, say rogue uh, nanotech outbreak... I'm picturing yeah. little nanobots running around. <laughs> Am I wrong? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. that, 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 yeah. I, I pictured that NASA had upgraded its. It's got an interplanetary communication network it wants to build, 
mm-hmm. um, with various relay stations. And I uh, pictured that um, becoming very complicated um, and um, eventually achieving self-awareness um, and, and up, upgrading itself into a kind of hyperspeed um, nirvana, which we couldn't follow. Um, only there's one relay that was shut down for maintenance when that happened and wakes up to find everything else is gone and it's there all by itself. Um, oh. um, and then there's the humans get involved with it. But it's, um, yeah, I mean, Mars is, Mars is tantalizing because we can see how maybe it used to be like the Earth and we can see how maybe it could be like the Earth again. I love those... Um, those mock-ups people do of what Mars would look like with a sea and an atmosphere because it makes you just think, oh, wow, you mm-hmm. know, so close. But whether we, you know, whether we can do that in a, in a realistic time frame is, is a completely another matter. Um, but a, 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 ter- a terraform Mars, great place to set a story. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay. So once we move past the rocky planets, we enter our gas planets. And these are the ones I love looking. Well, it's Jupiter and Saturn. I love looking through telescopes um, yeah. at. They're just gorgeous. So we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, uh, the furthest planets from the sun. They each have many, many moons that are probably more viable, mostly more viable than the actual planet themselves for colonizing. Uh, they're massive. They're balls of hydrogen and helium, and you couldn't stand on the surface because it's not solid. And according to my very, you know, high, highly sophisticated research into Wikipedia, <laughs> we immediately face an obstacle, which is that gas giants are not suitable for colonization, and there's no accessible surface. Um, there, the light hydrogen atmosphere would not provide good buoyancy for kind of some kind of aerial habitat. Uh, so what, yeah, what are your thoughts about Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune? Um, you missed out the fact they're also savagely radioactive. Oh, yes. You're um, right. so th- there's just no way, um, there's no way we could colonize even the upper atmospheres of a, a gas giant without some radical technology that we just don't have or can't even conceptualize at the moment. So why are um, they so radioactive? Is it their size, their composition? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. It's I, I just know that apparently a lot of studies into colonizing some of the moons of Jupiter have pointed out that the radiation from Jupiter would be render them completely inhabitable, uninhabitable, mm. sorry. Gotcha. Um and then you've got places like Titan, which pe- people think might one day, but you know, the seas there are made from hydrocarbons, um not water. Um, so it's an entirely different, an entirely different milieu than we're used to. Uh, mm-hmm. We would have to that, pantropy ourselves <laughs> if we wanted to yeah. live there. I read a, um, I remember reading a book, I think it's called Titan by Stephen Baxter, where he sends a team of astronauts there, um, and they, f- they fall into the, the, one of these freezing, hydrocarbon seas and are frozen and are revived a billion years later um, when the sun has started to swell and consume the inner planets but then it's springtime on Titan and all this life has evolved using water ice um, instead of carbon to create um, skeletons and, and, and bones and so forth. Um, so he postulates a whole using a completely different set of chemicals and a completely different set of building blocks this life that could arise on titan but it's radically unsuitable for us interesting um, as we are okay um, i read that saturn if if someone had to pick out of all of the the outer planets what could be the most favorable if realistic at all they they said saturn because there's 82 moons to choose from and that the radiation belt is supposedly weaker than Jupiter's, but I don't know if it's significant enough to be meaningful. Uh, yeah. But they're talking about harvesting the rings. Lots of lots of notes on harvesting, which I always wonder: are they harvesting to then create their domed cities, or it's just talking about new natural resources? If they can harvest water ice from the rings, okay, then you can use that water 
those big chunks of water ice to either crash into your chosen moon to create a atmosphere that i mean that won't last long but maybe will last a couple of thousand years before it all boils off or you can use it to you know i mean we are basically 70 percent water we need a constant influx to keep ourselves from drying out Mm -hmm. so you can use use it for that i mean whatever we do to grow crops whatever anything we do we're going to need water and saturn looks like a great big rest stop um on the edge of the solar system so i can see that being a great place there's also the the ice moons that perhaps uh, have oceans underneath if maybe you drill down through a couple of kilometers of ice there's this ocean and maybe we could live in those oceans protected from the radiation by the couple of kilometers of ice above us um um, you know maybe we could have this um sub aquatic life down there growing seaweed and other plants and what have you so that's that's a good possibility um but also there's the asteroid belt between mars and jupiter where you have things like Ceres, which is um i think the biggest which is sort of getting on for the size of a a moon it's it's so large that it um that its gravity has collapsed it into a spherical shape oh Um, and it's in the asteroid belt it's in the asteroid belt okay um there and there are a few others at vesta and uh, uh, my memory for names isn't what it once was um and you know it's possible you could create subterranean um societies there i mean in uh, the expanse they have a, a belt of civilization that exists in the asteroid belt um trading between the rocks and, and mining the rocks because some of those asteroids it's estimated just one big asteroid can contain enough gold and platinum to completely revolutionize the entire earth's economy there's huge wealth there and, and if you could somehow create a, a, a civilization there but the distances involved are enormous because all those rocks are so far apart mm-hmm. um and you'd have to get water and air and stuff to them so again you face that challenge but then they're out in space and they're not dependent on a planet which may or may not have a, a lethal radioactive belt around it so interesting so if we lived in the asteroid belt is it a pretty stable asteroid belt or would we have to worry about collisions i think it's pretty stable okay. uh, because jupiter keeps it stable jupiter's like a shepherd mm-hmm. um, and it keeps it um I think I think Jupiter has stopped a lot of all that those asteroids from falling inwards and causing trouble. The the problems come out in the Oort cloud, which is way way beyond Pluto. When something just dis- something disturbs something else there gravitationally, and it comes in and it maybe knocks, you know, gravitationally affects something and sends things. But the asteroids in the asteroid belt, it looks crowded when you look at a map of the solar system. But they are so far apart that the the chances of two of them hitting each other are just literally astronomical um but they're always revolving at different rates so they're always in different relationships to each other so maybe if you lived on an asteroid and your neighbor lived on another asteroid a hundred thousand kilometers from you as you went around the sun you would be going a lot faster because they were further out so after a while you'd be on opposite sides of the sun and then you'd gradually start catching up again so it would be a very different way of imagining territory than we imagine it now. And, and the terri- when, they're not, are they spinning too? Is there any internal gravity or are they just kind of floating there? Um, some may be spinning. I, I, you know, it depends on the collisions or, or interactions they've had in the past. Interesting. Um, so varied. Yeah. Okay. And we could, could theoretically spin them up, but whether, whether A, they're strong enough, because a lot of them are just kind of, amalgamations of collected rocks that have kind of drifted together over the millennia um or or, or whether we could spin them fast enough to produce any kind of internal gravity is uh is pure speculation at this point Mm, okay 
So then past Saturn, we have Uranus and Neptune, and I'll just throw in Pluto for good measure, Uh, acknowledge my childhood. So we're getting even further away now from the sun and we're dealing with cold, 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 cold. Now we're past um, Saturn and Jupiter. Does Uranus and Neptune still present the same radiation concerns? Uh, To be honest, I don't know. Um, They are both gas giants, same as Saturn and Jupiter. So um, I would assume that they would have certain characteristics in common. Um, They're kind of the forgotten gas giants because I never really think about them. I know, Um, me too. (laughs) And, you know, as a kid, I could never remember which order they went in. So who is going to want to live around a planet called Uranus? Yeah, I know. (laughs) Poor Uranus is just the butt of everyone's jokes. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And then Pluto, which I think of course, lost its planet status about 15 years ago, I think now, because yeah. it didn't follow the, what I think there's three rules of what qualifies as a planet. One is it has to be spherical. Two, it has to be the only one in its orbit. And the third one, I'm forgetting, something to do with gravity maybe. Um, but uh, then, of course, we found other objects in its orbit. And is Pluto part of the Oort cloud or is the Oort cloud just beyond Pluto? Because I think Pluto has a strange orbit, right? It's not circular. It's very elongated. Yeah, it's it's very. Um, it, it's it, sometimes it actually dips inside the orbit of Neptune mm-hmm. um, for, for 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 periods of time, and we've discovered things of of a similar size. So, if you wanted to live on Pluto, you're going to be constantly changing your like the atmosphere is going to be constantly changing on you the times where you shift further you know before neptune and then further out going intense cold to a little less cold uh so that's probably the most unstable living condition and yeah don't don't even bother colonizing no um no i think it's been classified as a kuiper belt object hasn't it and the kuiper belt is oh that's a... the kuiper belt okay so the kuiper belt and the, the Oort cloud is beyond the kuiper belt or how the, I'm... the Oort cloud, I think, starts like around an astronomical unit is the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and I think the, if I remember correctly, the Oort cloud starts about two thousand astronomical units out. Oh, so okay. Way the hell out there, um, and extends sort of um, almost all the way to Alpha Centauri. I think about three light years. Okay. So it's. It's very sparsely populated and very far out. Um, it's like the edge, the edge of the solar it, system. It's like the, it, it's it's it's. I think it's beyond the heliopause. It's okay. just way 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 out there. Okay. Um, I took three astronomy classes in college. That was years ago. I'm, I'm so. Um, I clearly I need to to polish up. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, there's there's some speculation that out on the edges where you know, um, the gravity of the sun is so attenuated um, that planetesimals on the outer um, edge of this Oort cloud may sometimes swap places and and slip into the Oort cloud of sort of Proxima Centauri or other nearby stars and then swap back again. There may be this constant swapping going on as um, these distant feeble gravities of these stars kind of one oh, becomes slightly more um and there, there's some speculation of, of kind of panspermia or the propagation of the ingredients for life through through the galaxy through this process um of the switching back and forth like that friction yeah and then occasionally if there's uh something disturbs um the orbit of one of these things they can fall maybe fall inwards towards the nearest star um and then they become a comet um and sort of deliver those those materials into the inner solar system. So. Interesting. And, and then the process starts all over again. <laughs> yeah. Well, Gara, thank you so much for joining me on this discussion about uh, planetary colonization in our solar system. But tell me about your projects, what you're currently promoting, anything that you're doing. Uh, yeah, well, I had a book out um, in February, a new novel called Stars and Bones which is the first in a new loose series. Um, and it's set in a universe where um, aliens came to save the Earth, um, but they came to save it from us. 
Mm-hmm. And so we've been kicked off the earth and, and set adrift in a, uh, some giant arcs and told not to mess with anyone else's biosphere again because we can't be trusted. Um, and, so, Interesting. Um, and it's it's kind of like a, an ecological Battlestar Galactica um, mixed with some cosmic horror because the universe turns out to be filled with rather more dreadful things than we were anticipating. Um, so that's out at the moment, Stars and Bones from Titan Books. I'm currently working on a sequel, um, but again, a loose sequel. This is a, this will be a series you can jump in at any point. Um, it's just set against the same background. Does your book switch between different points of view, or is there one central point of view? And and who is what is the point of view? Is it the human or the alien, or you don't want to tell me? Uh, no, it's written from several points of view. It's written from the point of view. Um, of a lady called Erin um, who flies a scout ship called the Furious Ocelot um, and she's searching for her sister who's gone missing on a scouting mission um, and it's told mostly from her point of view but there are also um, chapters narrated by her starship um, the Ocelot and by other sort of secondary characters um, who are involved in the mystery and, and the exploration and the hideous things that happen after that. It's basically, uh, yes, like my my earlier Embers of War trilogy, which was told from lots of different narrators' point of view. It, it's all told in the first person, by but by different narrators. All right. Well, thank you so much. Any last words on our subject today? Uh, I hope I haven't sounded too negative. No. <laughs> no, you just sound very realistic and you are a writer and you have to deal with you know, these interesting challenges to create interesting solutions. Yeah, because I would dearly love us to become a multi-planetary species at some point. Speculative Sandbox is a volunteer-run podcast that relies on the collaboration of fellow creators like you. Join the conversation and participate in fun polls and questionnaires on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Interested in being in a future episode? Our DMs are open, or you can email speculativesandbox at gmail.com.